Well, we're beginning a new sermon series, and just want to kind of give you an insight of why we do series or, or what's so important about that. Well, we believe that it's really important that we get on one message, that there's a theme that God is speaking to us. And when we look through the lectionary that's going through the years as those pre-prescribed scripture readings for each week as we uh, review those, there's an overall theme that God might want to speak in such a time as this. So we look at the theme, and then we look at the topics, and we look at the subjects, and we look at what is it as a community that we can have together that unifies us. So there's one message clear, made clear, that over so many weeks that a message uh, is, is doing something that's changing us from the inside out. And then we, what we do is effectively we use that into community groups. If you've downloaded the Intercessor app, if you haven't yet, please do that. But on the app is my notes. And when you click on it, it's an outline of each week for the sermon. And there's a fill-in that you can participate with. And then there are questions at the end. That same outline or that overview is then used in our community groups so that we're coming together and, and as we come together, it's, it's bringing the same unification of that same message so that we're on point where God is leading us. And that's why it's important as we have one message together. And we're beginning a new series, Building a Future That Leaves a Legacy. And what we're going to begin with in this series is having a vision and the importance of having a vision. And too often, we get caught up living, uh, living uh, some of us living in our past, and what we do is we glorify those days, and then for some of us, it was a more difficult time. So we look at the glory of our past, or we look at the difficulty of our past. And whether we're glorifying our past or we're running from it, the result winds up being the same, we're stuck in it. The Lord's not operating in our past. He's working in our present. So what does that mean? Yesterday's the day the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. No, today's the day. His mercies are being made new yesterday. No, today, every day. And the way we move from our past is we begin to build a future. Now, where a future comes, we have hopes and dreams of what might be. Building a future takes sacrifice, commitment, and patience. And as we begin to build a future, what happens, it empowers us that we could leave a legacy. Well, what's a legacy? Well, leaving a legacy adds value that outlives us. That's leaving a legacy. It's, it's a way that I'm contributing, that I'm adding value after I'm gone. When we build a future and leave a legacy, we live for a purpose that is bigger than ourselves. This church, which not too far off, will come up to 100 years old. When it was started in a basement and a hole was dug in the ground and they began to worship there and raise money to build the rest of the building. And we're sitting in a place for people who wanted to uh, build a future. For people who had a hope of building a future. People who now, because we have a place to worship, are leaving a legacy that outlives them. And then there's many who've been part of this place of worship for generations that, that are now having uh, left a legacy behind that has had an impact that's outlived them. Now this is vital to our personal life as well as our church life. We have to know who we are, where we're going, and what we do. Intercessor is committed to building a future that will leave a legacy. Amen. To do this... You have to have a clear vision, you have to have a mission, and then you have to have a strategy to accomplish it. Here's what you can't do. You can't wing it. You can't wing your spiritual life. That God has a plan in that for each of us. He has a plan for it in his church. Our church always has been and always will be about transformation. And that's the change of a human condition. That lives are being radically transformed through the love of God. That hearts are being set on fire by the work of the Holy Spirit. See, intercessor is not just a church it's a, it, uh, or some religious institution. It's a movement of God. Amen. 
And that's expressed in how we worship, which is what we know as convergence, where, where the fullness of the sacraments, the evangelical and the charismatic streams, they come together. And what happens is they make this one mighty river, all those streams. So we look at uh, the sacraments, and those are an outward and visible sign of an inward spiritual grace. And there's sacraments of initi initiation, which is baptism, confirmation, Eucharist. There's Sacraments of healing, which is confession and holy unction, which is to be anointed and prayed for. And then there's sacraments of service, which is holy matrimony and holy orders. Then there's the evangelical stream. And it's believing the scriptures of the Old and New Testament contain all things necessary for salvation. So what do we do? We read, we preach, we teach. Believing the good news of salvation is brought to sinners by Jesus Christ. Then there's the charismatic, hallelujah. <laughs> and that's, it's by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, all believers are empowered to participate in the fullness of ministry. That, that all believers come together. They're going to participate in that fullness. And we do this through gifts that are poured out by the Holy Spirit, where we should have words of knowledge, a greater faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, speaking and interpreting tongues, that that manifestation should take place in each of our lives. It's something, a gift that's given to each of us. And if we look at the early church and what was taking place, that you will see that they already understood what it meant to be sacramental and liturgical. That's a way they lived their life. The disciples or apostles knew what it meant to be evangelical because Jesus taught them the kingdom of God and what the gospel message was. They understood those things. But it was at the pouring out of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost that now the fullness of the church began. Amen. The new covenant began. That now that it was going to be this, this work that Jesus wanted to see come to earth and the fullness of that taking place. So in every stream that we express our worship to God, what it does is it brings life transformation. Every stream is meant to transform your life. But then when the three streams come together, you know what they do? They make a mighty river yeah. versus one trickling stream. And now you have this mighty river. And that river is a movement of God. Question becomes, are you ready to be a river people or not? Am I a river person? Am I in the fullness of that? Now, if you understand who we are, you need to know where we're going. And that the Lord has made clear a vision for our church. We're Christ-centered, multicultural, reaching people where they are, building disciples, and we're impacting our communities. That's the vision for this church. And having a vision brings unity to our purpose, and then it clearly defines our path. The prophet Habakkuk, he's crying out to God when you read his book. And he's feeling alone, and he's feeling like no one else is getting it in the culture. He's crying out to God, and he says, the nations are given to greed, power, idolatry, and immorality. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? That was 2,500 years ago. And we're getting upset. Oh, the culture. Yeah, it's always been messed up. It's not new. No, it's so bad. No, it's always been really bad. It's always been in need of redemption and salvation and transfer. Always been. Well, like, no, this is the word. No, it's not. It's always been bad. And Habakkuk's had it. Habakkuk's thinking, Lord, take him out. I've had enough. No one's listening. I'm a voice in the wilderness. You've called me to be your prophet. They won't hear me. So what does God do? He reminds him of his sovereignty. In other words, God's like, I'm still in control. Amen. Habakkuk, I got this. <laughs> and what he says is that the righteous shall live by faith. That'll be the difference. But then he instructs Habakkuk further, which is really amazing. He says this in Habakkuk 2.2. He says, then the Lord answers him. And this is what he says. Habakkuk gets his word from the Lord. Lord says this, 
write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. Now, you got to understand, to write it was really unusual because prophets would just speak it. And generally when prophets would speak a word of the Lord, thus saith the Lord, particularly throughout the Old Testament, it was not like, oh goody, here it comes. It was basically, you're doomed. <laughs> you're in trouble. You got to get your act together. But then there were gleams of hope of what was to come in preparation of what would, we would prepare our hearts for. And he tells them, write it down. You need to write this one down. You're not just going to speak it. You're going to write it down. This vision had to be written down that all who read it then would run with it. So you have a choice. When I see the vision, I'm either going to run with it or I'm going to run from it. In Proverbs 29, 18, it says, without a vision, the people lose restraint. In other words, without a vision, people become hopeless. Without a vision, people begin to perish. Matter of fact, this translation says, without a prophetic vision that God has spoken and what's been written down to give direction that you would understand, that you have to have that vision. Without a vision, we lose restraint. Without a vision, we perish. Without a vision, we live in chaos. But when you have a vision, this is what happens. He says, happy is the one who follows that instruction. Amen. And now I read it and I can follow it. In other words, without a vision, you have no future. Without a future, you will always return to your past. Here's Jesus' vision for the church. The church is the hope of the world. Amen. That's his vision. But pastor, it's chaos. I know. The church is the hope of the world. This idolatry, I know. The church is the hope of the world. And just a quick reminder, you're the church, not the building. Amen. We are that church, the community, the people. That's the hope of the world. You know what's not the hope of the world? Our government, academics, yeah. business. It's the church that God has entrusted the message of salvation to which transforms people's lives. That was his purpose. And we see this in the gospel reading today in, in the story of Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19, 1 through 10. Zacchaeus is going to have a holy encounter with God. Zacchaeus, we know, is, is, is rich and he made his money as a tax collector. And what that means is that, that he would take a higher percentage over what was actually demanded. And who he did it to was his own people. So to the Jews who were where his district was, he would just radically overtax them for his profit. And that's how he became rich. So you can imagine, tax collectors were despised and hated by Jews. This guy's stealing all our money. The vision Zacchaeus has for his life is this. I'm going to be rich at any cost. That's my vision for my life. It was clear, right? But that vision for him alienated him from friendships and a place to worship. So he was basically all alone with all his money. And he was missing everything else that was really more important. So there comes a day, Jesus is entering Jericho and he's coming through town and Zacchaeus would have known about him. He's a talk of the town of what's happening right now throughout Jerusalem and Galilee and, and those areas. They know who he is, Zacchaeus. He's moved to seek after the Lord, that this day he's coming into town, something in Zacchaeus is different in the inside, so he's moved as a result of him coming. But we know that there's a crowd, and it says that he's short. So he comes to the conclusion, if I'm going to see something, I guess i got to get above the crowd. I'll go climb a sycamore tree. Now, I don't know if you've been to the Thanksgiving Day Parade. There was some moons ago that we had gone sometimes to the Thanksgiving Day Parade. And one of the things you need to know is if you don't get there early, um, you're in the way back. And in the way back of the Thanksgiving Day Parade, and my family was never early. So it was, you know, we're lucky we made the parade. Parade's ending. We're like, hey, we're here. And we'd get, you know, get on the train, go in. It's cold, kids a little, whatever was going on. And you'd get there. And what would you do? Didn't matter how tall you were. You were behind stacks of people. He's doing this and trying to see, and some people standing on garbage cans, holding on to light poles. 
trying to see what's coming. Then I looked around, and I noticed there were some geniuses who came to the parade. I don't know how the heck they did it. I guess they carried them on the train or subways, but they brought ladders to the parade. And they unfold six-foot ladders, and then they just climb up on the ladder and sat on top of the ladder, and they had the best view. So I turned to one guy. I'm like, how much for your ladder? <laughs> Not for sale. Amen. See, because they were trying to get a glimpse. They were trying to see over something, and I don't think it had to do with so much with Zacchaeus' height. I think when Luke is writing this message, I think where he was short was in his spiritual life. That's the part that was missing. That's why he went looking. That's why he was willing to climb above, to see above whatever was going on because he wanted to get this glimpse. He wanted to see. In Luke 19, 5, it says, And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up, and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry, come down, for I must stay at your house today. And we could read this story as Zacchaeus sought after the Lord, but the truth is the Lord always initiates the call. Not only does he initiate the call in our life, he calls us by name. Amen. He calls us by name. He, he looks and he calls Zacchaeus by name. You've got to understand what's happening in this crowd. Predominantly Jewish people gathered around. Here's this one who's a prophet, a healer, maybe the Messiah. And, and, and there's Zacchaeus. You know, he's lucky he didn't get stoned in that tree. Like, he's, you know, he's not the flavor of the month. And here they are. And in the midst of the crowd and the parades coming through and people are trying to get a glimpse. And, and Jesus pauses. He looks up. And he points to him, and he calls him by name, and he says, Zacchaeus, come down. You know why you need to come down? We're going to have a party at your house. And Zacchaeus' response says everything we need to know. What he was looking for and God initiated, his response tells us everything. Scripture says in Luke 19, 6, he hurried, and he came down, and he received him with joy. Even though the crowd's going, boo, he was despised. They were furious that Jesus chose him out of all the other people he could have chose. He chose Zacchaeus. See, when the Lord initiates the call, we could do one of two things. You could run from it or you could run to it. Zacchaeus is so moved by this encounter. He's so moved by that moment of, of, of fixing his eyes on Jesus that he, he loses his mind. All of a sudden, he starts spurting out things. And he's got Jesus there and disciples there, and they're having this great meal. Music's playing. They're eating hummus. You know, it's a, it's a good time. <laughs> Any time with Jesus is a good time. Yeah. And this is happening. Zacchaeus is like, let me tell you, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take half of what I have and give it to the poor. Jesus is like, all right. He says, you know what else? All those people I robbed from, I'm going to pay back four times over. Jesus is like, all right, I didn't, I didn't tell you to do that, but all right, it's the key. Yes, this is what I'm going to do. Something's different. Something's changed in my life. Zacchaeus now has a new vision for his life, and he's going from being a taker to a giver. So now he could build a future that will leave a legacy. Every disciple demonstrates habits that reflect a response to the transformation that you've experienced. That, that there's a response to that. Here we talk about five habits of every disciple. Connect, pray, serve, give, and share. We do it as a community. It drives forward through our vision that we understand these habits. They're acted out or lived out in our lives individually, then collectively in our community groups. And what they're an outward expression of our relationship with God. That's what these habits are. And I believe in all the habits, the give habit is an accelerator for the rest of the habits. It's, it's the give habit that demonstrates our trust for God. That's where the moment comes where I'm, I'm letting go and I'm going to trust God. 
Now, over these next few weeks in this new series, we're going to be talking or encouraging what we're doing, which is called a faith commitment. As we look at the vision the Lord has given us as a church so that we can begin to plan for our future as a church. So what does that mean, a faith commitment? Well, we're all called um, to come and we bring our tithes, our offerings, but a tithe we come and we bring, it's called 10%. That's what tithe means. And we give that back over trusting in the Lord to do what he desires. It frees us to begin to walk our life as a disciple. It accelerates all the other gifts as we're learning to trust God. And it doesn't matter where you're at with that, but we've got to begin somewhere with that journey. And then we look at a faith commitment saying, Lord, I'm putting my faith in you and I'm making that commitment forward so we can plan what you want to accomplish. And for those who've been faithful in that commitment, what you're doing is building a future that will leave a legacy, like the people who've come before us here now. And for those who might be struggling with it, I want to get you on a path of freedom. So what did we do? As a church, we purchased a free gift. It costs us money, but we're giving away. That we're going to give to all of you. And it's a gift. And, 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 and what the gift will do is transform your life. It's called Ramsey Plus app. It's free. It's a free subscription we paid. And it, what it will do is guide you from debt to saving to planning for a better future. It's a downloadable app. You do it on your own. There's outlines. There's things you can fill in. There's videos to watch. It's like Netflix. You can just, you know, crank it out and go through them and begin to apply that to your life. You know, I hope all of you binge watch it and use it. It's a gift. And the gift is only as good as the person who will actually take it. But that's given. And you'll find that on our website or on our app. It's a gift we're giving you through this process because we want to see what God can do powerfully through your lives. So what happens? Zekia has a radical encounter with the love of God, with the love of Jesus. That encounter redirects his life, which now his life has meaning and purpose. Before it didn't. Before it was about being rich. You know, it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. Money's not the root. It's that love. He was bound by it. He was bound by greed. He was bound by selfishness, and he was alone and isolated. But what Jesus does is brings him back into community. What Jesus does is gives him a hope for a future. What Jesus does is allow this radical encounter of his love that redirects his life. And now his life has this meaning, and it has a purpose. Finally, Jesus says this. In this whole story, what encounters, and all those who are there, that takes place. And Zacchaeus, who's the happiest guy in the room, that something's different now in his life, has a new vision for his life. Jesus says this to them. He makes this statement. He says, today, salvation has come to this house. Today. Since he's also a son of Abraham, which means he was a Jew. And then Jesus says this at the end of verse 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That's why he came. Zacchaeus' story is each of our stories. Each one of us is a Zacchaeus at some point. That, that you've got to climb your own sycamore. That you've got to get somewhere to look out and look over. That you've got to look past your problem, your situation, your struggle, your circumstance. That you've got to begin to just look over. But remember, God's initiating the call and he's drawing us to himself. But it's the same story as Zacchaeus where we might be alone and isolated and struggling, whatever that is. But we're not alone. That's a lie. But we've got to make a step forward to begin to look over the crowd, to begin to step over those things. So when we look at Zacchaeus' story, it's a story of redemption, salvation, and transformation. That Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. The church is the hope of the world because Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. Jesus establishes the church. He makes it the hope of the world. That's the vision what's to take place for his church on earth. So that we would build a future that leaves a legacy. Church has been doing pretty good. It's still going 2,000 years later. Amen. It'll continue to go because it's his church. And he'll continue to build his church. The vision is about Jesus and bringing real life transformation. That's the vision. So what do we do as a church? Here's what we need to do as a people of God. We need to pray. We need to pray and ask the Lord to align our lives so we can better fulfill his vision. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you don't leave us directionless. 
We thank you, Lord, that you make clear the path. And maybe there's some here today that have some obstacles. They can't see above their circumstance. Maybe there's some here today who are just um, living in their past and they're stuck. You want to come into their present, which is now. And if you're one of those people, you've just been allowing the absence of Lord to reign in your life, I want to introduce you to the Lord that he can reign in your life now. And you do that by having a relationship with him. And that's how heart needs to change. You got to get out of your head and into your heart. Well, it's where the heart, where he wants to do a work. What do I do? I just surrender. I just say, Lord, I repent. I've tried to do it my own way. I want to do it your way. So you pray and you ask him to come and invade your heart in that way. And I want to offer you a prayer that you can repeat after me and you can begin this new, incredible, amazing journey God has planned for your life. So if you'd like to pray with me, just repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I thank you for dying on a cross for my sins. I open the door of my heart and I ask you to come in. Take control of my life and make me the person you want me to be. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed with me in person, online, either way, most important thing, just let us know. We're going to get you on that pathway of discipleship. You're going to discover God's purpose, God's plan, God's power being made known in your life. Amen.